Welcome, everyone. Thanks for showing up on, uh, you know, just before beer at Demo Palooza. So we'll try to get you out on time as much as possible. I'm Paul McKeith. Uh, this is Jeff Lindholm. And if you notice, you know, it does say engineering manager. He is my manager. So everybody I got to ahead of time with the <laughs> cash, thank you in advance. If I didn't get cash to you yet, let me know. I'll take care of you later. Not you. Yeah, just not you. <laughs> So we're gonna try and dive right in. So here's our agenda. What we're really gonna be concentrating on is upgrades. Your life cycle is always a question that comes up. So we're gonna hit that one right off the top so that you know where you stand today, what, where you're gonna to need to go tomorrow or March 31st, uh, as we just discussed earlier. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and how you can, uh, do your choices in terms of your upgrade and moving from SLUS 11 up to 12, 11 to 12 to 15, or skipping over 12 altogether and going to 15, if you so choose. And then those upgraded paths, there's a different kinds of different ways or methods that you can use uh, that we'll also go through and we'll even show you a couple of demos of those too. Hopefully we'll have enough time. We've got three demos. Hopefully we'll get that third one in there. So again, as I promised that we would talk about the life cycle. Here is our life cycle. This is right from that URL that you see on the bottom here. So you can go and pick this up. But basically, all of our SLES um, implementation, our instances, once are released, it's got 10 years right out of the box, plus an extra three years if you really need that little bit of buffer zone. I think we understood earlier that you might. So uh, that's not uncommon. So that's why we put that in there. And uh, so you can get some more details about this at this page. Some of these slides I'm going to try and go through pretty quick. Driving, diving in a little bit deeper, uh, March 31st, coming up real soon this year, last week. That's when the SLES 11 SP4, which is the last SP on SLES 11 that's going to be available. So if you're in this situation, you're going to want to talk to us and get yourself taken care of on LTSS so that you can stay compliant, make sure that you're still supported. Okay, now a lot of other folks are probably still on, if you're on SLES 12, SLES 12 SP3, because only last December, SLES 12 SP4 came out. So we'll talk about getting you up to SP4 to get your clock um, started to get on that, again on that SP, and a lot more of these details. But again, each one of these is a 10 year life cycle. So you saw 10 years ended up, or ended on SLES 11, on the SLES 12 code base, that's going to end in 2024, so you got quite a bit of time there, plus the LTSS, so an extra three years on top of that if you need it. SLES 15, of course, is the most recent, so from 2018, a little bit of math, 2028, it'll take you there on your general support. And once again, we do have the LTSS options if you still need more time after that, if you're even around it and still doing it. So the other thing is, is that most organizations that I've dealt with, uh, often won't touch anything until they get that dot one release and the dot one release of SLES 15 is slated to come out uh, it's in release candidate right now and so if you want to participate in beta you can get access to that but it is slated to come out here in June so if you're on the precipice of maybe going 15 you might want to wait a little bit and go for the SP1 because of requirements we'll talk about some of those too okay now if you happen to use SLES for SAP from us, and the specialized distribution comes with some extra add-ons, the high availability extensions are included, some optimizations for SLES, but there's also an enhanced support cycle for the support packs of four and a half years on each and every one of those support packs as well. So you get a little bit extra support and a little bit more wiggle room in terms of doing your upgrades there as well. And we're still, is the ability for us to go above and beyond that, even if necessary, back into the LTSS. But again, Yes, indeed, it is done, SP4. So I'm gonna go backwards here for one second. And I've got a question for the room. And I'm really just kind of curious. We're gonna find out who has the oldest vintage <laughs> SUSE <laughs> Linux Enterprise Server instance. Is there a prize? Ah, we can come up with one. You might win that one. <laughs> no, so um, as Paul mentioned, SLES 11 is coming to end of general support. It's hard to believe it's been 10 years. Um, we have a 13-year commitment with each of the releases. And as many of you know, SLES 10 
went end of general support and end of LTSS actually uh, a couple of years back. So this is something that happens about every three years in terms of the major life cycle releases. But I'm kind of curious, um, do we have a lot of SLES 11 still in the marketplace today in the room? Yeah. So I just want to underscore the point that there is a extended life cycle offering. If there is need for access to security patches or need to uh, get the maintenance and support extended for a period of time, talk to your sales team, talk to your partner that's selling with SUSE. We're quite flexible and we're willing to work with you. Out of curiosity, are any of you still nursing along any SLES 10? I see a couple of hands. Anything older? How far, how, how far back are you going? Plus eight. eight. All right. Wow. All right. I owe you a beer. <laughs> I'm sorry. But, okay. It's all you, bud. I don't know what to say now. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, for all of those, and we'll be concentrating on the SLES well, 11 guys, which is the good only thing I most. would say about SLES 8, just to be clear, is it better be on an isolated network, if at all possible. And yeah, that's, that's just a point. recommendation. But see me afterwards if you want to chat. Yeah. yeah, no, it, really it just works. I, I don't disagree with that, but there have been a number of vulnerabilities ranging from user space things like shell shock to kernel vulnerabilities that just aren't going to be remediated. So, Yeah, that's a big one. There's even some stuff yeah, built right into the operating system. I went to a session earlier that we're talking about most of those uh, built-in security anti-attack vectors that were built in through both um, Open build service and SLAS, we're in SLAS 10. So that's probably a little safer place to be. But OK. So and we'll give you guys some, uh, especially the SLAS 11 guys, uh, some different paths and different options and things you want to think about in making your decision on going to SLAS 12 or 15 and on how you want to do that. OK? OK. So you know, this is a generic kind of thing. And it's a, my, yeah, we've heard it all before kind of thing in some ways. but Check the release notes for each one of these. And even if you plan and you've decided after talking with us and, and going through this, you want to go to SLES 12, check out the SLES 15 release notes as well. Because then you might be able to think a little bit more forward ahead and make some different decisions on what you would do with SLES 12 just to make room for when you eventually, except for some folks in the room, will get to SLES 15, right? So might be a good idea to do that. I, I don't think there's an actual absolute answer for that for every situation on skipping and of 12, but you can absolutely do it. And we'll, we'll talk about that and we'll, we'll show you some references it's, on doing that as well. The short answer is it's always a cost benefit. It depends on your workload and whether or not that app is supported on the newer release. And as Paul stated, when you look at this slide, which you'll see a recurring theme here, and you probably saw a recurring theme in Mr. Vosberg's hands-on session that accompanied this. Sorry, the sessions were a little bit out of order. Um, his hands-on were earlier in the week. But this is actually a, a pretty big deal. And one of the things we'll talk about is when do you upgrade versus deploying new? And generally, I'll say there's a rule of thumb that you don't want to do a major version upgrade more than twice because you're bringing along some stuff regardless at this point, looking at things that have been deprecated, things that have been removed. and we have methodology for migrating workload from one instance to another that can be leveraged as well outside of an in-place upgrade. So we'll hit yep. on that if time permits. Yeah, we'll talk a little bit about that as making a decision on to do an upgrade uh, in place and keeping that or to do a fresh installation. So we'll have some of those check boxes that you can take a look at. This one's important. You don't want to get stuck. So if you're using older versions of Postgres on SLES 11, you are going to want to upgrade to V9 before taking the step up to SLES 12 or SLES 15. Okay. If you're on V9 on SLES 11 and go to 12 or 15, it's just smooth, nothing, you don't have to worry about a conversion or anything. If you don't, you're going to be in for some pain. So that definitely is a big one. Which there's a couple of versions like 9.4 and 9.6 on SLES 12 and there's steps for going through those upgrades as well. You just want to get up to a version 9 class release prior to making the move. Yeah, good. Thanks, Jeff. Okay, so let's look at some upgrade scenarios. 
give a little bit of history. I'm going to blow through this really, really quick, but just understand that a lot of the techniques and things that we've been talking about here have been around for a while, and they haven't, they've been enhanced and, and added to, they haven't been deprecated and lost. So some of the major version upgrade processes we're talking about is around since uh, 2010. Uh, we'll also talk about using auto yes, not from, uh, even though you can still do it as an installation capability, uh, but also from an upgrade perspective. In fact, that's one of the demos that we'll be able to show you here today. Uh, and then uh, from a DVD menu, if you have lo a low number of servers you want to do, then uh, the boot menu is going to give you an upgrade process just by booting from the installer DVD, which kind of changes in 15 as well. We'll talk about that. And one thing that uh, I didn't mention when we talked about the life cycle is LTSS. This is really important. So LTSS is kind of, you're not in general support anymore, so you're more of an exception-based support model from us. We're absolutely positively going to make sure that we test those upgrade processes so that if you're on an LTSS path, you can jump into a new major version upgrade without worrying about any considerations of those PTFs and things that we gave you in the in-between time, okay? That'll even help you uh, skip over a lot of things from uh, support packs as well because, you know, you don't want to have a bunch of, uh, you know, jumps in between there. So you'll be able to go, and we'll show you a couple of those, okay? So these are where you're going to start when I'm making, evaluating your decisions on what upgrade paths you're going to want to look at. So as I mentioned with a simple DVD boot or off on a, a USB stick or even through a Pixie boot, uh, then doing a, a couple of servers, it's no big deal, or doing it manually. But it's starting to get into 20, and you might want to consider some automation with an installation server using SUSE Manager, uh, something. Um, and even if you consider you might not make any mistakes doing it manually because all very skilled and everything, depending on how you do it, you could actually end up with differences within your deployments, which can be bad and kind of, you know, nerve wracking and, and just, you know, just bother you in the future when you're trying to troubleshoot something because you have inconsistency on your installations because your upgrades took so long that code changed and you're not consistent across all your servers. That's somewhere where uh, SUSE Manager can help you mitigate that as well. And that's why when you get, start getting close to 20 or greater, you want to think about more automation for that. Um, you also definitely want to look at the certifications, like we're talking about SP1 with 15. Make sure that your hardware and your software is certified to run on the target that you're going to. Um, available disk space and partitioning can be pretty important too because you may have really, really kind of pinched the pennies and were really tight when you did it on Celeste 8, right? So it's the ability to, <laughs> sorry, sorry, that's, you're, you're gonna get it a couple times, I'm sure. <laughs> uh, but, you know, you didn't accommodate enough to get up to, uh, to store all the extra size of, even if you didn't add any software, you know, the code just grows, it just does. So it might be, that might be a good impending factor for you to do fresh installs and migrate instead. Um, let's see, and then also, uh, even considering that, right, a BTRFS that came out with SLES 12 has some system rollback capabilities that's gonna make your upgrades actually uh, give you a rollback instantaneous, very much like in a VM world. And if you're on an old, smaller, you're not gonna have enough space allocated to your operating system to do that. So again, might be a contributor into doing a fresh install. Um, or you simply have learned some things, hindsight's 2020, and you wanna do some things differently. Um, some of these are, uh, we'll talk a little bit later. Um, our hardware architecture changes, Jeff will talk about a particular scenario and going from I-586 to X64 was a big deal, right? That's not gonna be an in-place upgrade, uh, but there are some ways you can automate that as well and make that smoother and more consistent across your implementations. And the same is even true in the power world as well, not just Intel. Okay, so we talked, in fact, this question already came up, right? Do I go to Celeste 12 or do I go to Celeste 15? So the very first thing is make sure that your hardware and your software is gonna let you do that. Um, that's gonna be pretty much a binary decision for you uh, to make sure that you're supported when, when, doing, when you're doing that. So make sure you take a look at that. On the bottom here are a couple of links where you can go and check the, the software and the hardware that's been certified against those. Uh, so uh, you'll be able to get access to that. Then the other question is, is what's in Slice 15 that I might want? 
Okay, and remember, we want to look at those release notes and what's in there anyway for future planning, even if you do 12. So let's take a look at some of the things in SLES 15. I'm going to try and blow through these really quick because we've got a lot of stuff to talk about, but as you would naturally expect, the kernel did change. Uh, it's a kind of unusual, actually, in SLES 12 that we use the same kernel, slightly different, so you still maybe have some, you know, it's not exact parity, but it's going to be pretty close in terms of your hardware support. Uh, so that's kind of a big plus if you go to CLS 12. If you do, uh, if you're using OpenLDAP, the 389 directory server is going to replace it, and you will have to migrate that across. It's not going to migrate your LDAP directory uh, contents uh, for you. Uh, we've changed over to a salt management structure. You're going to see this across the board. Um, we mentioned Don and, and uh, SUSE Manager. That's the underneath pin under core of it now. And that's also, being, that's also true with some of our software-defined infrastructure elements of CAS and everything else that we're doing. You're going to see a lot, lot more salt. So it's really going to help you uh, where it's there by default, whereas in the past operating systems it was not. Real quick, Crony does replace NTBD. It's, not ex it, it's a little different. So if you're doing any scripting or anything, you might want to look at that a little bit deeper. Firewall D replaces SUSE Firewall 2. This, again, is sort of... The reason we did that is because SUSE Firewall 2 was built way, way back when you know, it only needed to be a router more than anything else. Mm. And to make this part of our multimodal IT operating system, Firewall D gives us a lot more flexibility when we start talking about Kubernetes and containers uh, and virtualization. Quick commercial, Firewall D has a pretty nice graphical utility in the workstation extension if you want a little bit more visual view of that configuration. So. Yeah, wow, very good. Something new. Okay. Nginx, if you're fans of that, is in there. And it also happens to be the underpinnings of RMT, which we'll talk about in a second. OpenJDK 10 might be important, especially if you're running the old Java code that Oracle is now charging for updates. Uh, so we've updated that as well. Um, and I almost went off on a tangent there, but I won't. I'll re re reluctantly do that. System D. Now, if you went to SLS 12, you were accustomed to System D change from init scripts and uh, System 5. However, well, they, yes, exactly. So, but this is, and that was the warning that you know that's the direction everything's going. And so now, going in in 15, it's the default. So your de if you did resist it and didn't go all the way to system D, then this is where you're going to want to be. Well, especially on the sign at D stuff, which was a mass security mask for potentially risky ports, but it was retained in SLES 12, and it's not even there in 15. So, so, that's, so again, this is part of your decision making on if you're going to move or not, right? If anybody's running Nagios, this forces you to run uh, NRPE as a daemon rather than a Zynet D driven right. thing. Right. Right. So the only reason I ever had Zynet D installed was for that. So Yeah, so it can be know. it can be a pretty significant uh, consideration for you. So uh, if you do pause and go to twelve, you know you've got a long uh, quite a few years here on twelve still, so that'll be fine. Uh, just you know prepare yourself to eventually get rid of that, right? Yes. No, if I upgrade from so is it 12 to 15? Will the system still exist or it? Yes, so 15, it is the default. And if you do a fresh install, that's it's all that's going to be there. There is a compatibility no, package. To be clear, system D is the default on 12 as well. And the compatibility layer is being slimmed down as time goes on, meaning that when we moved from 11 to 12, there was a lot of compatibility stubs put into the operating system. Some of the old tools like IP, replacing if config, you look at the legacy route command, netstat, a few other things like that. Those things, frankly, upstream community has deprecated many, many moons ago, right? And we've dragged those along. We had stubs in 12 and 15. We're actually requiring the use of a new tool set, looking at IP and IW. So, sorry. Yeah, no, that's good. And then uh, there is one compatibility package, but you will have to put it on top for init scripts. But that's it. Um, yeah. yeah, it's definitely the direction the last, to go. The last thing I'd add here is we do still have a legacy module as well, which is going to be packages provided for convenience for people that are upgrading that have some dependencies. And there's a select list of 
compatibility releases in there that have a very limited life cycle commitment, but we understand that there are people that have dependencies, companies that have deployments that need those pieces, looking at some of the older Java and a couple other pieces. Syslog so. engines in there as well, right? Well, so. um, we had a, we deployed, we upgraded to Celeste 12 um, beginning of the year. And we've already had multiple um, escalations from the crony replacement. So crony is, will complain if it has less than three uh, upstream servers and NTPD is just happy with two or one. So people need to be aware about policy changes regarding Crony and NTPD update. Good. Good oh, news to share. Yeah, thanks. I'll just yeah put that on there. So, yeah, Crony D, uh, and you said you had some escalations. Yeah, yeah. We had customers who had deployed in, you know, our, our appliances with the NTPD installed there and had two upstream servers in their enterprise. Mm -hmm. Crony needs three. So, three upstream. So, yep. our support team would typically write a technical information document on something like that if you had to open a service request? No, we just fixed it ourselves. We, well, we changed the policy. We had to tell our customers your enterprise servers aren't correctly configured. You need to have three. I'm wondering if that was in the release or not. I no. Don't seeing that. no, it's not. It's buried in the man page of the documentation for Crony. Okay. So a nice little feature, an add-on, uh, the zipper search packages. Sometimes there's a, the install installation process with Celeste 15 changed quite a bit. There's a single installer um, that's across all of the, you know, not really in different distributions anymore. It's a single installer for the desktop, for the server, for everything. So that, the, along with that, it came the ability is like, where did my package go? So zipper search packages will help you find that in the module or extension that you have. So that's uh, a pretty, and that's also available on uh, uh, SCC. RMT does replace SMT, but I would say most customers are gonna stick with SMT for a while. The biggest thing is, is RMT is not gonna support Celeste 11, so you might even wanna wait a little bit on moving up to SMT. SMT runs on 12, and it does not even exist on 15. So and uh, the opposite is true, right? You can replicate the 15 repositories with an SMT server, but you got till 2024, and it has to run on 12. Exactly. So, and don't expect RMT to ever run on top of 12. So, Never. yeah. So, SMT is probably the way to go for now. So just to tease you, because you missed some sessions since we're so late in the game, right? Yeah. There, is another, there was another session earlier. Now, the reason that I pointed that out is two reasons. One, there is a, an older version of it that was, is a bright talk that you can go get. It's actually quite good. Uh, one of our engine distinguished engineers gave it. And also, it's my understanding every session here, self-included, is being recorded and will be available to you. So. Um, even the other ones that are on here that I mentioned, uh, that like this one that's happening right now, so nobody run out and go see that one instead. <laughs> okay, so the futures and things like that. See, we already have somebody doing that. So <laughs> those, you know, these are available to you. So and I have another slide with some other ones for Slush 12 for you, for some other ones. So one thing that I want to point out uh, real quick is in our documentation and throughout here, you're going to see this term of online and offline. So online is referring to the state of the OS, the server being up, right? Versus offline, the server being in a down state, like you're gonna boot from a DVD or something like that. Uh, that's going to, uh, these two kind of ideas determine what your upgrade processes and paths are, are available to you. So for major version upgrades, offline migration is the way to go, and that's the terminology in the documentation, right? Uh, in fact, online migration is not possible. In other words, my operating system's up and I cannot upgrade it without taking it down first and either remotely booting it, booting it from a stick or auto yes or et cetera, okay? So that's gonna be one of your decision factors because it is gonna take the server down immediately during that whole process, okay? Uh, minor versions, however, are online capable, and minor versions being your support packs. You'll be able to do that online doing that. And the main reason for that, if you're curious, is that the uh, libraries, the glib libraries that are on here, are going to be incompatible, and there's, we've tried to make it work, and we just found too many corner cases where it isn't going to work, and it'll end up crashing in the middle of an install, and that's not it's, good. You're going to end up with a brick. 
It's also additional understanding that's been programmed into the installer to understand our package merges, deprecates, removes, and really the re-baselining of the operating system. The installer is much better prepared to handle that versus a channel-based upgrade, right? So. Okay, and then of course, if you're on uh, doing an online migration and you're using BTRFS and, and Yaster Zipper, those are all built into the snapshot capabilities, so it'll give you a quick and easy rollback if you, not, if you need it to go all the way back to the previous version. So consider that too, if you're prepared for it, if you're using it. So this is also out of the documentation, so this is just a graphical representation of what you can do. So we heard SLES 10, right? No SLES 8 on there, sorry. But SLES 10, SLES 11 can't go direct to SLES 12, but you can through 11 SP4. So if you get up to 11 SP4 from what you had before, you'll be able to go directly to SLES 12 SP4. You won't have to go to any SPs in between. Similarly, the online migration path will take you all the way from SLES 12 GA all the way up until SP4. And then, of course, GA, you can go directly. And remember I mentioned about LTSS and the ability to skip everything else in between and go direct off to SLES 12 SP4. Similarly, on SLES 15, you have very similar capabilities. Again, SLES 11 direct SP4, you can go to SLE 15 GA, uh, you know, no SP1 yet. This is also from the documentation, so it's not mentioning that. But you'll notice the same type of path that you have. In fact, SP4 is not even in here yet, that's why it's a plus, because that was new. And then you can actually now with SLE 15 go from leap all the way directly into SLE 15 as well. That's a new one, that's a brand new one. What's leap again? Leap is the OpenSUSE version. Ah. Yeah. Okay. So there's a direct alignment between the OpenSUSE community, leap 15 releases and the SLE 15 releases. <laughs> The LEAP packages are going to have a, an LP150 designation as included as part of the file name, and they're not going to be signed by SUSE Linux Enterprise, per se. But if customers were using a development environment with LEAP and they wanted to take that image and move it to a supported infrastructure, that is a path we're prepared to help our customers out with. So. And this is a big change. Uh, we've always had a really pretty tight relationship with the OpenSUSE um, side as well. In fact, we do a lot of code sharing between them. Uh, code base is essentially the same, and now it's just a little bit farther to make it easier for you to move from one, especially in a development environment, up into a fully supported environment. Okay, so what kind of upgrades methods do we have? We talked about a few of these already, right? So using media, either um, locally booted or remote boot is one of your options, and remote be boot being Pixie, you can look to get those packages from uh, the SUSE Customer Center. You can use SUSE Manager or SMTR um, or the RMT in order to get those packages for you and third-party tools as well. It's just kind of a, a re-assertion of everything we talked about before. Again, online upgrade pass or service packs only. That's going to be the key. And one thing that wasn't readily obvious in the graphics is that you can skip service packs. Now, I recommend that you take a look at the reference notes and what the recommendations on which ones you can or shouldn't uh, skip in doing that path, but we, we absolutely support that capability for you as well. So the skip function was added in SLES 12 and is also available in SLE 15. This is not something that's available in 11. You would need to get to SLES 11 SP4 first. Um, there are some limited paths from 11 SP3 up to earlier versions to SLE, of SLES 12. But again, getting up to 11 SP4, if possible, would be recommended. But as one of the caution sign items we had, you need to have a tested and repeatable process. And you need to basically beat this up in the lab, make it work, make it repeatable, and make sure that you have a good expectation of what that end result is going to be, because that is ultimately what we're committing to, to support. Is anybody using a desktop, SUSE Linux Enterprise desktop? That's going to be one exception for skipping on the support packs. All right. It's just not a QA path for what it's worth. So you never yeah, dupe, it's, zipper dupe works. I will tell you that, but it's it's not a formally supported offering, and the desktop does not enjoy the same 1013 commitment because, frankly, the desktop's getting a little long in the tooth by the time you have a new major release out, and most people are keeping up to date. And that's a really good point, right? We're concentrating on what is officially supported. There's a million things that probably work 
that well, are, you know, that we're not talking about. The other caveat I'll throw out here, and you'll see in a couple of examples up, is our services team can help you QA different <coughs> scenarios. And I'm not saying we're straying outside of what the tested and supported model is. But occasionally, flexibility <coughs> is warranted. And if you've got a use case you want to talk about, talk to your sales engineer, engage our services team, engage our partners, work with us. We're willing to work with you. OK. OK, so now if we get into greater numbers, uh, this is where maybe on a tenant install, and even just for the consistency I talked about earlier, uh, would be a good idea. Uh, and so that's available, and we had kind of touched on this earlier. Here are the, the guides that you can get access to to help you, uh, because you're not, it's not readily obvious in the, in the official documentation, but these guides will give you the information you need to do that, because it is supported. So each of the major releases has a best practices section that is posted, and many of these supplemental docs that have been put together to assist with migrations like this have been added there, and that's part of what's going to be covered in doc day tomorrow morning, actually. Um, the documentation team and Micah Chabowski and team are basically doing a group powwow around our documentation and going through opportunities and questions, feedback, and how you can contribute to our documentation and kind of what our roadmap is looking like there, too. So. And notice on here, too, the SLUS 11 SP4 to 15 is supported, but the general rec recommendation is to do a fresh install, mainly because of a lot of the things that I talked about earlier for considerations. And in general, just, you know, I don't know, I, that, that big of a jump just makes me feel a little, yeah. No, I, it, there's nothing wrong with it, but the reality is, is two major versions beyond two versions is starting to get to the level of question, and my biggest feedback item there is riser FS and SLES 10. It is not available in 15 and it is deprecated in SLES 12. Do not try to pull that forward. Most of you probably have that bye-bye at this point anyways for the most part. So, <coughs> even better. Ah, which was, uh, I bit my tongue all the way to this and he said it, it's on a slide later. <laughs> okay, so we're gonna try and get a, a couple of demos in here. So I'm going to turn over to Jeff, to the man at the keyboard, the wizard behind the curtain. All right, so I've got a VMware environment running on my Dell 5520 here, and we're going to go through and show you guys three demo examples today as we're finishing up the content. Um, I've put together three scenarios, one of which is a manual upgrade from SLES 11 SP4 to SLES 15. And frankly, you can boot the ISO and upgrade interactively by basically clicking through and the system will upgrade the root operating system assuming that the partition layout, free disk space and the other system requirements have been met. You can get an upgrade completed and get from point A to point B, understanding that your application is along for the ride. Um, when we look at this environment, what I have here is just a virtual machine and if I log in as the root user, Sorry, this is a VM console, so I can't make it much bigger, but you'll see that it, I have um, my repositories added here. There are no patches pending, so this is patched up to current. And it's connected and registered at this point, right? So the easiest thing to do here is to reboot this instance with the SLES 15 DVD. So we're just going to go ahead and reboot it. Susie Studio. You can build custom install media in the uh, open build service. You can also use Kiwi at the command line. My uh, DVD must not be attached. One second. We use Susie Studio to keep this as skinny down as we could to hopefully get it done by the end of the demo so you can see the end results because this is real. Correct. There we go. So what we're doing is booting the SLE 15 installer ISO. This is about a 750 meg download. Um, you'll find that the SLE 15 installer does rely on a, a number of add-on modules and add-on products in an effort to slim down the distribution. We also have a packages ISO that can be used to facilitate the upgrade for anybody that's disconnected. 
package's ISO is almost 8 gig. It does fit on a, du on a dual layer DVD. Uh, that said, you can do sneaker net, SMT servers, RMT servers. There's a number of different ways of working through that connectivity question. In this case, I'm going to be using a uh, SMT server as the back end. If you don't have either of those, do you end up with noose? <laughs> noose, Don. Not yeah, and that is some truth, and that is something they're actually uh, working on, meaning that if you were just to install the installer ISO and you did not add the desktop applications module or the base module as part of the install configuration, you're going to end up with a booting kernel and very, very minimal toolchain in terms of working. So you do need to have some selections, and the upgrade will also pull along what's required here. So what I'm going to provide is two boot parameters, one just telling it to initialize the network via DHCP, and I'm turning off the self-update because I don't want the up, up installer to update itself as part of its startup. So I do. Thank you. Ooh. Ooh. Look at that. Good call. So um, all that's passing actually is upgrade equals one for a boot parameter. No worries. So this is going to go ahead and initialize the SLUS 15 installer. Um, as you'll notice here during the hardware initialization phase, we've got to wait a few seconds for Wicked to start up and initialize and get a DHCP address. But ultimately, I'm going to end up at a workflow that looks very similar to the standard installer, but the items that you're clicking through have changed because upgrade equals one activates a secondary workflow in the installer that is really built around upgrading the operating system. So one of the slides earlier did mention that this upgrade feature has been supported since right about 2010. I think it was SLES 10 SP2 upgrading to SLES 11 SP1. We had a very significant customer by the name of <coughs> Intel that has tens of thousands of servers in their development environment that they want to get new tool chain out on, they want to keep up to date, but they don't want to go through and reconfigure and redeploy all that. And they brought the problem to us, and frankly, we're happy to oblige and support it. You there look are at some alt other Linux distributions that support in-place upgrades, but the restriction is so onerous, we would probably never choose that. Yeah. So this is actually quite flexible. There is an auto yes profile that can also be used, as you'll see in the next demo, that allows you to customize. We'll hit that in a minute. But if you walk through the workflow here. You do have to confirm your language, and the system will go out and probe and search for available systems to upgrade. You'll see that I have a SLES 11 SP4 system available that's built on EXT3. I'll go ahead and hit Next. This is, this is an obligatory warning. And again, I'm, I'm interactive right now, so this isn't on a timer. If I was doing this unattended, it would be counting down and continuing past this on its own. All this is warning that. Um, if you were using dev by device name mount paths in your FS tab environment, you may want to remediate that before you move forward because newer versions of the operating system prefer persistent storage identifiers like UUID equals or dev disk by ID. You'll see here that it's going to make me accept the end user license agreement for any of the releases that could be installed. The system did detect that it is SUSE Linux Enterprise Server. Yeah. See? Moving along. I thought you really had something to show. <laughs> so you'll see that I have previous repositories here for SLES 11 SP4 pulling updates that are pointed at an SMT server. These will be removed. You can toggle the status so those would exist but would be disabled if you wished, but you're probably never going to install. SLES 11 things on a SLES 15 box. Whoa, whoa. What was that? What did you do, Jeff? That's a good question. So a couple notes while he was looking at that. One, when the keyboard was chosen, and some of this information you'll find in some of the other sessions too, um, but if you don't you know, use this, this slide there and go back and take a look. Server. Oh, yeah. The, uh, um, the keyboard that you choose during this up upgrade process is only for the upgrade process, so it won't stay persistent. So if you're in a global situation or multi-languages, 
You don't have to worry about it changing the default keyboard layout um, in another geo that you might be doing this for. Uh, also, the RPMs that are uh, the layout of where they came from in the older versions uh, have changed when you went from SLES 11 to SLES 12, so they might be in a different place like we talked about the, uh, uh, the, the second DVD of packages. Now, that means that the, those RPMs might be in a different package that you might not be familiar with because of modules and extension in 15. And they may have even changed again going from 12 to 15. So if you're familiar with where they went and what's going on between 11 and 12, 12 and 15 might be a little bit different as well. Uh, so generally recommend that you include all of them so they make sure you get them. Then you can always remove those uh, after the fact. Um, and there's a slide on here that will give you kind of that um, information as well. And then there's also some information later um, or in the other sessions that I talked about a little more detailed on it. In fact, a lot of the things that we've talked about here, a lot more detail than some of the other sessions that we had, because especially on SLES 15 specifically, we went a lot deeper directly into that. Okay, so we got a little bit of a cooking show here, and we're going to let the file copies happen as Paul is finishing the slides. I will, yeah, I'm getting to that, so hold on one second. Um, as I mentioned, we've got three scenarios. I'm going to go back and retrofit the SLE 15 and resolve that issue when Paul's on the slides, but the other thing I wanted to do was kick off an upgrade from SLES 11 SP4 to SLES 12 SP4, and this one is going to be using an auto yes profile. And in essence, what we're going to be doing here is leveraging the same upgrade, except that we're going to be providing it a boot parameter of auto upgrade equals one self underscore update equals. I want it on installation, and the auto upgrade equals one covers it at this point, because you don't want to pass it upgrade equals one and auto upgrade equals one. Correct. And again, the self update, and that setup equals DHCP. And I'm going to point it at my auto yes file here on my web server. You can do. Um, you can specify all the static information there. Correct. And in this case, I'm just forcing it to initialize the network as part of the boot process here. And we got 12 sp4 up dash auto dot xml auto upgrade equals one self update. I think we're good to go here. We'll let this one kick off. And this one will actually run fully unattended. And when we're waiting for the file copies, I'll get the 15 moving here. And we will click back here momentarily. Mark, right now, now, one quick thing that uh, is something that's not obvious out there, too, is uh, Sleep 15. There's two install DVDs and two package DVDs. The second one of each of those are the source files. So you don't need them. So if you're doing an upgrade, you don't have to have both of the DVDs for the installed media, and you don't need both of them for the package unless you want the source. Which is the exact opposite of what support told me. I blew up this level of migration on Friday. Really? No, I'll have to get back to them on that. Okay. Well, well I, I guess that's why I say it wasn't really obvious, because when I looked at it, that was one of my first questions. Well, when, I, when I tried it, it looked like the package is two DVD over the choices repositories for package one. Um, if I didn't see it in the, in the list of repos anymore, and syslogng wasn't there, uh, and RPE wasn't available on a couple other fun things, so I just want to get back and try it again. So that's a really good thing because our customers can call support. Now if I try to call support, they tell me to go fix it myself. <laughs> they would give you some advice that you might not be able to quote here. Basically. Yeah. Go read the manual or file a bug. Have a nice day. But you'll see that this SLES 12 upgrade is giving you the same message, but the countdown for the dev disk by name is going to be automated on a 10 second countdown just so somebody can look at it. If you're running unattended and you want to confirm what's going on here, you can pass the boot parameter Y2 confirm, and the system will pause before committing the update if there were any changes you need. And if you look at the details here, this is going through and actually executing the upgrade along with applying the updates coming from the SMT server so that I'm not only upgrading the SLES 12 SP4, but the most recent SLES 12 SP4. I noticed you don't have any modules in your 
this is a very lightweight image to save time. Typically, you'll see with SLEE 15 that the modules are auto-activated, which is what I'm going to resolve here. But with that, I will let you get, keep moving. So and we're, we're running uh, long, so I'm going to try and kind of blow through some of these as much as we can. Uh, this is a very familiar slide, and yes, we're just trying to remind you and you know, warning, warning, danger. So I won't, I won't force you to listen to me and read it all and everything, but it is in there. And actually, you kind of already seen this, uh, and that's just in verbal um, or written out basically the processes that we're just taking on, so I'm not going to jump into that. Uh, very similarly, here's a little bit more information about what you're going to do uh, to your AutoDS profile in order to do this as well. And some of those uh, settings that kind of Jeff talked about, you can automate in here, like the Y2 confirm, etc. cetera. Um, it is kind of interesting, too, and it's in here. If there are specific RPMs that you want to block, you'll be able to do that in your AutoDS profile, too. Uh, something you'd have to manually clean up if you do this through DVD. Uh, there is a... Um, just in case, just to be forewarned, there is a backup capability in the AutoS profile. It's about configuration of your RPM configs. It's not a system backup, so do not think that and do not rely upon that. Okay. So, do I do an upgrade or do I do a fresh installation? So, this question already kind of came up, but we already kind of said, well, it depends. Well, I'm going to say it depends again. So in here, we put a lot of the things that you want to consider in making that decision so that you make the right decision for your particular uh, needs, right? So just kind of, you know, in a funny way, Slash 12 is not, you know, just another score pack. It is binary incompatible. Much like we're saying the online upgrades, you can't do major upgrades. That's really kind of the piece that's involved here. Plus, we're going to clean out a bunch of stuff that nobody ever used. It didn't, you know, didn't make a big splash in the market, or what have you. So those things are going to change there too. And you know, we do make mistakes too. So imagine that. You know, I make mistakes. My manager doesn't, right? Hey, I just made one. Oh, you're supposed to blame me. So all of that, you know, that's another reason to remember it's a it's a different thing. So that's got to be in your calculations. Uh, back to the hardware and architecture we talked about, I'll split over that. There is even some uh, concerns with your hardware that the old, you know, the old graphic cards might not be supported on new stuff. They want to get rid of it, you know, maybe even more than you do. So that can trip you up. Even something like token rings, not supported in Celeste 12. I, I didn't even, I wasn't aware of that until I read Floppy that. drives are not in Celeste 15 anymore. And that's right. Yeah, no floppy drives in Celeste 15 and I went, <gasps> Oh my goodness! Right? But the question is, why does Floppy stay in the kernel of 15? That should be removed. I'm, I'm sorry, sorry, what was the question? Floppy kernel module still in the 15 kernel. If you pull the 15 up, you look at the module, Floppy still loaded. I had not noticed that. Did you notice that? Oh, that's Floppy. So far, Verizon app has well, it's still in the kernel too. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll have, have to check, check that out. out. In 15? Yeah. 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 You can, so if you happen to have a riser FS, it might work. But don't call. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. Don't call on that. Okay, so this is kind of a reiteration and some of the stuff that I verbalized earlier, so I'll just move to that pretty quick. Uh, some other things like we, we did talk about, you, you got to look at your file system like, I think, yeah, here's the riser one. This is one that I was mentioning, right? So Solus 12 did support riser to read it on a fresh installation. You weren't able to do that. Much like System D, uh, Solus 15, no riser support, even though it's in the kernel, as we were just talking about. And the other thing is, is if you do an upgrade, you're going to end up with uh, orphaned packages. Now, you'll be able to go find them and clean them up if you need, but that's going to be a bunch of nonsense that you probably don't need. So that's also a ramification of doing an upgrade instead of doing a fresh installation to be aware of. Okay. Now, newer support or older packages that aren't there might still work. So you might want to do that on purpose for that reason alone. Uh, but they may not be supported either. So again, back into your cost-benefit analysis. Did you want to move over, Jeff? No, you're good. I was just showing this movie. 
It was, uh, okay. We'll go back and look at the result in a minute. It was subliminal messaging. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's see. We kind of talked about the database. Uh, the RPM new and RPM save config files, uh, you're going to want to take a look at that. And actually, sometimes when folks kind of wonder why it keeps growing, is when you do an upgrade, the old configuration files and the new ones, the defaults are in the RPM save, are the old ones, and the new ones of the default settings in those RPM uh, configuration files are going to be on that server. And they're going to continue to grow every time that gets updated. So you might want to look for those even just to, to check them to see if there's something that you needed to uh, bring forward into the new uh, system or to clean them up, okay? Oh yeah, and this is an interesting thing too. Um, actually updating RPMs instead of doing the fresh install is actually takes a lot more time because of the differentials that have to calculate during the upgrade process. It takes quite a bit of time, so it actually takes quite a bit longer to do a, uh, an upgrade than a fresh installation. So that might be part of your calculation on your cost benefit, right? So again, on the fresh installation, the nice thing is, is you get to look back and do things differently, uh, of course. And then you'll be able to take advantage of some of the newer fe features, especially if you're on the older stuff on SLS 11 when there was no feature RFS and you want to have the ability to do a really quick, easy rollback in case something does go wrong, uh, then you'll have that built into the operating system uh, if you're doing bare metal. Of course, you have that ability if you're doing this with VMs and taking snapshots, and I think, I'm not sure where it is, but I'll mention it now anyway, just make sure that if you're using snapshots as a backup, that that snapshot is taken when the server's in a down state, not in a pause suspended state, okay? Otherwise, you're not going to like yourself, right? <laughs> so, and that's why I say it's an easier rollback mechanism, you know, if you don't have VTRFS, which you see the equipment built into the operating system, okay? Now, do I do an upgrade or a fresh install to 15? Do you want to take over? No, I'm just showing these guys. It's continuing the last part of the install. On the slow slow. Okay, so again, SLS 12's got a long road ahead still, 2024 for general support. So you don't have to go to 15, as we were talking about earlier, so it's early dates of SLS 15. Unless there's something in those release notes that says, I've really got to add this, this is really cool stuff. Uh, or especially on the hardware side for hardware support. Um, but in general, right, and this is kind of where I was feeling queasy before on the two version hops and skipping, and, and just consider those things as well. Right, when you make your decisions on what you're going to what you're going to do. Now, in general, though, if you're, there were some issues with SES 12, so there are some general recommendations that if you're on SP2, if you started your installation in SP2, you didn't upgrade to uh, SP2 on SES 12, then um, an upgrade is just it's going to be pretty good. You'll, you're going to carry in all of the older things that were fixed in between. And it's probably generally safer to make sure that you know, if you are aware, if you know how it was initially installed, if it was installed with SP2, it'll make your uh, life a little bit easier. Okay. So unattended upgrades in SUSE Manager. We actually had a demo of some of this, and we're almost out of time anyway. So I'll give you guys these slides, but basically this is a way for you to automate and make more consistent. You can pick point in times on the, the RPMs that you're going to use so you can have a consistency and have a lot more control over what each and every one of your instances are there. That may be more important than, uh, than anything else in your particular environment, especially when you have many, many oodles and oodles of servers. Don, you have anything to add to this real quick? Some of these guys, I think, were, were in my session, but yeah, we demonstrated this. Uh, going from 11 to 12, 12 to 15 or 11 to 15 can all be automated in much the same way that what Jeff is, is shown here. Yep, and so, and we do have those guides that'll help guide you in doing that as well, okay? So we got a couple of use cases that, uh, did you want to go through these? Yeah. Absolutely, so we were talking about flexibility with our services team and support team. We understand that customers have a variety of deployments that they're dealing with, and deployment standards change, virtualization platforms change, gold images might vary from year to year. If you look at what you were doing with SLES 
11 SP1 versus new builds with SLES 11 SP3. Maybe you increase the size of the root disk partition, right? Bottom line is when you look at these kind of upgrades, there is an opportunity to standardize, right? And one of my customers actually went through an upgrade process where they were um, evaluating what standard do we want going forward for our next generation environment because they want to take advantage of ButterFS. They want to resize the root file system so that there's enough space to accommodate the snapshots. And at the end of the day, they centered on a plan to do a P2V migration of the source machine to a new virtual machine infrastructure. So as part of this, they were consolidating the previous hardware and cloning that physical instance into a virtual environment, at which point we could correct some of the errors of past sins right, in terms of looking at changes or other items that had been fixed. So basically, they created the bootable ISO with Kiwi to provision the new destination machine, did the clone, and then ran the, the upgrade against the clone instance, uh, leaving the, the source intact so that they had a recovery point. And after everything was upgraded, they'd shut off the source machine, leave it in the rack, to fail back to in case there was a problem, but basically move forward with that virtual machine consolidated and having an upgraded environment. Second, the, yeah. I think the coolest part about that, right, is the opportunity to change the root file system during that process. Absolutely. Um, if you think about cloning that in, there is marginal EXT4 support within SLES 11 SP4. Uh, with an additional kernel module. And given that it's only a temporary situation and the upgrade can basically usurp and add the ext 4 drivers as part of the SLES 12 upgrade process, you absolutely could do that. The same holds true with ButterFS in terms of actually copying that in. Now you have to take into account sub-volumes and there's a little bit more complexity with that type of migration and the moving of that data, and that is probably going to be a little bit more um, involved. In this case, they started that effort looking at SLES 10 to 11 because we promoted ButterFS to full general support in SLES 11 SP2. Exactly. And um, that was part of our ramp up to getting it to be the default file system in SLES 12. And because we have the kernel modules, the versions are maintained we have the ability to also bring that up and validate that the source is in fact installed, running, and configured properly before executing the upgrade, at which point SLUS 12 or 15 can pick that up and run. To Paul's earlier point, depending upon the version of SLUS 12, um, the GA release did not have an initial snapshot at the root volume um, before the install took place. And there was a corner case scenario where there was a uh, disk space leakage that was potentially going to happen, and that's one of the reasons why they were saying if you had an SP1, SP2 level server that place forward, you're good. You know what I mean? If you had an older one, there is some remediation work that might need to be done there, and it was just something that was caught, unfortunately. The second use case I'd like to point out, just talking about a specific customer here, is we have a large a uh, retail pharmacy that happens to be north of the border up in Canada that was also working with our services team. And they were introducing SUSE Manager to their Sleep Pause environment. Sleep Pause is our enterprise point of service offering. And it's what they use to run their cash registers, their branch servers, looking at the store servers that are running in the environment. And their particular branch server happened to be deployed on an I-586 distribution which is not KVM virtualization friendly. That said, they wanted to be able to deploy a virtual machine with the SUSE manager proxy. And we came up with a method for them to upgrade uh, using the current config that they had in place by doing a parallel install. So they were using logical volume management. They had enough space in the root volume group to make a new root partition. We installed to that and then reconnected the data mount points and the information that needed to be migrated from the I-586 environment to the x86-64 infrastructure. We technically did not upgrade that, but we were able to take that instance forward without having to completely redeploy because the, we could do this with pre and post scripts. We actually put together an automated process that saved them from 
having to do site visits across, I think, about 1,500 stores. That equated to a seven-figure savings for them in terms of working with it. So lessons learned here, absolutely, you need to test. So that's a good thing. I am going to finish up one last. So I do have one last demo that I can show you um, with regards to fully automating this experience. And if you look at opening up a browser here and going to manager.demo.com, this is my SUSE manager instance that we're going to use to facilitate the upgrade process. So we log in as the admin user here. What you'll see is that I have all the channels mirrored in for both SLUS 12 and SLUS 15. Um, not anymore. That's a lot better. So sorry about that. If we look, we have systems registered here, and I have a SLUS 12 S. I'm sorry, a SLUS 11 SP4 system that's fully registered and onboarded. This happens to be a traditional client, which, depending upon when you built it, before potentially before SaltStack was a thing in SUSE Manager. We had a scenario where the RHN stack or the um, traditional spacewalk stack could be used for onboarding and management, right? As part of Don's hands-on and as part of, frankly, the SUSE Manager framework, you can actually migrate from the RHN stack to SaltStack, and we can do that as part of the upgrade, right? But the key is, is we got to get this off of SLUS 11 SP4 to, to SLE 12. And if we go back down to the uh, software area, which I've got right here, you'll see that I have some clone channels that have been created. And this is just using Spacewalk clone by date. Um, I've taken and cloned our full channels into channels that are owned by the SUSE demo organization and included all patches up through and including March 31st, right? So what's key about this is I can use any snapshot channel to facilitate this upgrade, and it can be the same snapshot channel I'm using for my day-to-day -day patching, meaning that I don't have to do a post-install patching to get to an identical bit level looking at the versioning of the operating system and the associated libraries. When we look at how we actually execute this, this uh, in-place migration, we can go back to the uh, systems view and go under the auto installation tab. What you'll see here first is we have a distribution that's been created. This is, in essence, an installation source. This installation source can be used to bootstrap the installer either via Pixie Netboot or via what's called Kickstart over a network, which will take the install kernel and copy it to the existing boot partition, and at which point we can invoke this upgrade with an auto yes profile. This auto yes profile can actually be stored within the provisioning mechanism within SUSE Manager. It uses an underlying technology called Cobbler. And you'll see that it's using the distribution auto install tree of SLUS 12 SP4. I'm passing it the auto upgrade equals one process here. And if we scroll down, this is my auto yes profile that I have pasted into SUSE Manager that's going to be used to provision this upgrade. What's interesting here is I have the ability to do variable substitution. So you'll see I have dollar sign Red Hat Management Server, dollar sign Channel Prefix dash SLE Manager Tools. These are variables that are actually stored in the profile, and these can be substituted in, along with snippets from a profile management perspective, so that you can build dynamic profiles that can automate the upgrades for large numbers of servers. Right. If you go over to the right side here, we can get a fully rendered auto yes file, and this has all the pre and post scripting to reboot strap this instance as part of bringing it back up. And it basically activates with what's called a reactivation key so that you don't lose any of the device history. You'll also see that we're overlaying the um, update channels and the SUSE Manager Tools channels to the upgrade process, and this will run completely unattended. Yeah. Yep. Yep. You can just provide the URL here, and assuming you have an RPM signing key and a repository signing key that's been imported, 
you can pull that in and import that into SUSE Manager. Otherwise, you may have to turn off repository signing, which again is a security question, but if it's your repository and you're signing it, so be it. Zipper will still do bit level checksums on each RPM as it's installed to ensure that our packages are signed and that the, the validation is there. Is, is, is there a good guide to creating an auto? Yeah, auto? yeah, there is a template that's posted in the upgrade documentation going from SLES 12, 11 to 12. Actually, it started with 10 to 11, but you could do 11 to 12 or 11 to 15 or 12 to 15, actually. Um, there are definitely uh, snippet profiles, and it's a very small profile that I can bring up and show you here in a minute in terms of the required contents. But with no further ado, just due to time, I'm going to go ahead and kick this upgrade off. If we come back over here to the provisioning tab, what this will do is basically give me the list of auto installation profiles that I have available. I could provision a completely new instance of SUSE Linux Enterprise Server on this hardware using one of these profiles. I just happen to be selecting a profile that is configured to invoke the installer in upgrade mode, right? And if I select that and I hit schedule auto installation and finish, the system will put a job in place and it will create cobbler entries for Pixie Net Boot and it will go out via the traditional RHN stack and basically start the process of the upgrade. So if we go back to my machine where this is running, go ahead and log in and I think we may take the Pixie Net Boot route today. So this is just a standard SLES 11 SP4. Uh, let's take a look at boot grub menu.list. It has not hit yet, but let's go ahead and do a Pixie Net Boot and we'll let it invoke like that. Normally OSAD checks in periodically and there's a Jabber daemon where it will come and basically look for work to do. If you're not using OSAD, it'll wait till the next time it checks in. Um, yeah, you could. I was just wanting to show off the, uh, the Pixie Net Boot function more than anything. So if we do the network boot, this is going directly against Cobbler on the SUSE Manager server. And if I were to SSH into the SUSE Manager server and look at the Pixie Linux CFG, there's a MAC address.config file sitting there with the proper boot parameters waiting to basically bootstrap this upgrade. So this upgrade can be invoked over the wire because frankly we can Pixie boot the installer, period. And if Cobbler's already adding all of the proper boot parameters to facilitate the upgrade, the idea is that we can automate this and do this at scale. I've been trying to get our network team to allow uh, DHCP in the server IP ranges for going on a decade. You can also do Pixie off disk. Um, there is a Pixie disk option that's provided as part of Cobbler. Um, see me offline on that. We can talk about it for a few minutes. So, um, the other thing I'll go back and show you is our SLES. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't get a chance to finish that one. But um, SLES 12 SP4 is finished here. This was the unattended upgrade, and if we go back and take one last look here you'll see that my installation is starting and you were asking about the auto yes profile that's required. I have that snippet pasted into the um, auto installation profile, but if I go to my web server here as well, and maybe I have too much running on my laptop, there we go. Just dot one. I need to shut off one of my virtual machines. Either that or it's the wireless network being choky slow. So if you look at the auto upgrade XML, this is actually a very small profile. And that's really all that's included. It has basic sections that direct it to keep the installed networking, um, whether or not you want to confirm the upgrade, um, what overlay repositories you're looking at, and you can place software directives in place to control, add, remove of packages, and you can do pre and post, as Paul had mentioned earlier. And I would say full auto yes to XML is actually not as complicated as it looks. If you were building a clone profile, for example, 
we actually capture everything, including users, groups. Our users and groups are created by our RPMs, and AutoYes still will capture everything on that box. With AutoYes, the term less is more is actually 100% true. If it's not defined, the system will take the defaults. The only user you need to have defined in an AutoYes profile is root user. You can put another side user, user space um, user in there as well. But none of the daemon users are required because the RPMs create all those users in the first place. Kind of finishing us up here, um, Don's hands-on is referenced here. Again, we don't, we don't tape the hands-on because that would be probably pretty boring to watch people sitting there typing at their computers, but... Watching Don is boring. <laughs> So, last items, we're going to send this out to you, but when you're doing a 15 upgrade, you do want to enable all modules. That's the last item we were going to share with you, and that's just the way the modules have been situated with regards to how the, uh, the upgrade is working and the modular nature of the operating system. So you don't end up with a new one. Correct. So, last question. Um, yeah, so we're, we work in, a, in an air gap, what you guys call it air gap to environment. And I, you want to be able to install off of a USB stick a Celeste 15. It yep. doesn't sound like that's possible. It is absolutely possible. And I would suggest creating a custom installation image with Kiwi. Um, that's item number one. Item number two, you could put the um, installer ISO on the USB stick along with the packages ISO if the USB stick was big enough. Alternatively, you could air gap an SMT server pretty easily in terms of taking content from what I would call an internet-facing SMT server to one that is living inside where there is no connectivity. That is another way of doing it. There's a couple different options we have there. So. I've done the USB one. Yeah, it just seems like you're downloading eight gigs. What's another 700 megabytes to put on it? Right. <laughs> well, and it only needs a small subset, which is why I suggested Kiwi, because Kiwi will basically carve out exactly what you want. And you can deploy it, frankly, as a block image or pre-build any of the image types that are supported by Kiwi. So, any other questions? Yeah, yeah. yeah. for zipper packages, that Wolfram option, when did that, which version of the did that end up getting in? Oh. Dash, dash orphans on yeah, so that is a SLES 12 thing in terms of looking at probably SP2 and later, I'm guessing. Yeah. It's definitely in 12 SP3. But it is Demo Palooza, so I am going to dismiss the room. Thank you very much. Thank you.